morning. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, uh, yeah, so the plan is uh, that uh, Shahar and I will uh, share this part of the boot camp. And uh, there'll be six lectures in all uh, spread over these days. And uh, so I start today in the morning with uh, a basic uh, introduction to communication complexity. And uh, Sahar comes this afternoon uh, uh, with an introduction to the combinatorial applications of information theory. Um, tomorrow morning, uh, I will use some of the definitions that uh, Shahar sets up. So uh, it's not terribly important, but there will be some sort of a connection, and we coordinate between ourselves. So for today's lecture, I understand that many of you are actually experts on communication complexity. But uh, uh, this lecture today is not for experts at all. So I'll just start as with the assumption that uh, You've probably not seen communication complexity, and uh, do what I can. So, This is uh, the familiar setup. So you have two parties. One is called Alice. The other is called Bob. And Alice has an element as a input x from some alphabet capital X. And Bob has an input y from some alphabet capital Y. And they have a fixed function in mind, which they wish to compute. Okay, so this is some sort of uh, broken down model of distributed computing. And they wish to compute this f on their input x, y by exchanging messages. Okay. Our goal is somehow to minimize, or their goal is to minimize the total amount of communication. That is, the total length of messages that go between Alice and Bob. They do this using, they communicate using a protocol. And for our purposes today, uh, what we mean by, proto by a protocol is a tree. So so the idea is that once they have their inputs x and y, they start communicating. They communicate using bits. And who speaks first and who speaks next is somehow encoded in this tree as follows. So just because there is an A on top, it means Alice starts first. And based on her input x, she either sends a 0 or a 1. So for some inputs, she's going to send a 0. For other inputs, she's going to send a 1. Okay. And then if she sends 0, then Bob decides what to do. And this way, they continue until they reach a leaf. 
And at the leaf, the value of the function is stored. So at the moment, everything is deterministic. And the protocol is represented as this tree. Is this uh, all right so far? So, uh, so once you fix the input x and y, the leaf that you reach is completely determined. And that leaf I call leaf x comma y. Okay. And there is this path <coughs> that the computation took. And that path will be called the transcript on x and y. Can be fixed and path can be something that I mean. No, sorry. The, no, no, this is a tree. So, uh, sorry, I, yeah, I should. Yeah. So, this is a tree. So, the moment the leaf, so it is fair to say that the leaf also is the transcript, but we'll just <coughs> pretend that the transcript is the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jacob, question. So the fact that you have an A on that branch means that you have A sense of one, that will continue sending something? Yeah, sorry, yeah, that's right. So, we don't. Uh, insist that the players strictly alternate. Okay, so whose turn it is next is determined by the label on the node in the current computation. So at the moment, if A happens to send a one, uh, Bob should understand that he shouldn't speak yet. It's Alice's turn to send the next bit, and eventually, when they reach, hopefully, a node here which is labeled B, <coughs> it is then that Bob will send a bit. So what Bob is going to play next? What did you mean? By that? Oh, like does Alice have the whole knowledge of this graph? Yes, she has the whole knowledge of this graph. They both, in fact, when they had this function f, they first sat down and built this graph, and then they went away. Alice was given her x, Bob was given his y, and then they started playing. Okay. But for every input x and y, the leaf that is reached should in fact contain the correct answer to this function. Only then will we call this a valid protocol for this problem. Okay. And now the total length of messages is kind of uh, easily seen in this. That is the length, the depth of this tree the length of the lo longest path from the root to leaf in this tree. Okay. So the goal when they sat down to build this tree was to build the tree of minimum yeah, height uh, which achieves this. Okay. So the deterministic complexity of the function f is the minimum over all protocols f so who tells us what to say at the next I mean, it's got to be something that... Oh, so actually at each node, is there's also a particular function, f okay. and g. Sorry, I shouldn't use the same letter, uh, h. So this is an h which is specific to this node. So each node has a particular function that labels it. Alice's functions are just functions of x to 0, 1. Bob's functions are just from y to 0, 1. Isn't Alice's function a function of x and whatever you seen from Bob at that point? The fact, so, yeah, so yeah. The, the fact that it is at the node already takes, so yeah, so, okay, so the official sort of definition of communication complexity when everything is written without pictures and trees, you say that what you say next is a function of what you saw so far and your input, 
but uh, we'll, since we are yeah, doing it in a picture, I think that is taken care of somehow. Yeah. What you see in the past defines a particular node. Yeah. That's right. So, so yeah, it's taken care of. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, I think, uh, so, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, this is a reasonably good way to start in the beginning, and uh, many recent results on communication complexity when they talk about you know, compression and information costs actually use the protocol tree in this form. So, yeah, it's no big loss uh, not to have uh, done the original definition. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so. <coughs> So uh, the first, so I want to give some examples of uh, functions that can be analyzed, and the first function I want to think about is the equality function. Okay. So, what are x and y in this case? Capital X is the set of all n bit strings, and the capital Y is the set of all n bit strings, and the output that they wish to compute is just a single bit. Okay? And as you might have guessed, uh, <coughs> they need to determine if if x is equal to y or not. Um, so. <coughs> so the deterministic complexity of the equality function is at most n uh, for any function on where one of the parties has n bits, the deterministic complexity can, cannot be more than n because it's always possible for that party to just send the entire input over to the other player. Uh, uh, the other thing, the way I have set it up here, uh, in the end, you might think that only one party gets to know the answer, and that's the way it will be. Okay? <coughs> so as long as one party knows the answer, we say that the problem has been solved. All right, so it turns out, and uh, we just uh, sort of uh, show this, that there cannot be a better protocol than this trivial protocol deterministically, where one party sends the entire input. So it's probably fairly obvious. There are many ways to see this, but I'll uh, my goal is to somehow introduce various uh, concepts of communication complexity through this example. So I'll just tell you something called the rectangle. So now let's look at a particular leaf here. Okay. And let's ask what inputs arrive at this leaf. To arrive at this leaf, <coughs> Alice and Bob must both cooperate. Yeah? <coughs> so if there is a unique path to this leaf, and if either of them sends you off the path, then you will not get to this leaf. Okay. <coughs> so inputs x and y which take you to this leaf L will be called a rectangle. Why they should be called a rectangle we'll see very soon. But let us look at all those inputs that take you to this particular leaf. Okay. And that I call the rectangle that is associated with this leaf. It turns out that this particular set is actually 
a cross product of two sets, yeah. uh, one which somehow uh, looks at it from the point of view of Alice, and the other uh, looks at it from the point of view of Bob. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that L is of the form S cross T, where somehow in English. Uh, so what do we mean by this? So suppose you have a particular L, okay. and we want to know whether the computation will reach here. Okay. Now, what does Alice, suppose we ask Alice, do you think the computation will reach here? Alice just checks all the nodes that have A as a label on this path, and sees whether her input X is compatible with this path. That is, is it true that at any of these A nodes, Alice would have had an input which would have taken it, or Alice's input would have taken it off this path? So that is the set S. Question. Why is it possible that that depends on what's in the path that Bob made a decision on? So that's what exactly. Once you have reached a particular node, Bob's decisions are already known because so it just depends only on Alice's input. So you've come to this node A and at, with label A, and we ask, will this function H, which labels this A, output a zero? No, I agree that's true once you get there. Just, there may be other paths which Bob made different decisions that, that Alice has exactly the same x. So if Alice has an x, which will, so for all nodes labeled A, Alice's X, is, Alice's X will take you in the right direction, okay? And suppose it's also the case that Bob's input will, is also compatible with this transcript. Yeah. Then this pair X and Y is compatible with this path, okay? So, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. There are two decisions, one of them to be made by Alice, and the other to be made by Bob. Alice's decisions are entirely determined by her input, and Bob's decisions are entirely determined by his input. And, and that is the reason. <coughs> so now, let's see. So this function f itself, <coughs> It's a function of two inputs, so we might write it uh, as a table here. So these are sorry, Alice's inputs, and these are Bob's inputs. And yeah, a typical input of Alice is x, a typical input of Bob is, and we write f of x. Now, with each leaf L, we associate a rectangle. So that is some set of inputs of Alice, some set of inputs of Bob, and for all these inputs, the protocol takes you to the same leaf. That means the answer is the same. Okay. So for the ent entire rectangle, we reach the same leaf, and it is the same common answer, z. So that means each such rectangle that 
corresponds to a leaf is monochromatic. So if you had a protocol and you looked at its rectangle and you placed that rectangle onto this matrix M of F, so what is M of F? You, yeah, you label the rows by X, the columns by Y, and write F of X, Y here. And look at those locations of this table which correspond to this rectangle. And what you will find is that if this is a valid protocol, then all entries in this rectangle will have to be the same. Now, if this matrix doesn't admit large monochromatic rectangles, so if this matrix is such that it doesn't admit large monochromatic rectangles, then what we conclude is that the number of leaves in your protocol tree must be large. And if your leave, number of leaves is large, then the depth will also have to be large. It's just a binary tree. So what did we do? We talked about rectangles. We noticed that rectangles have to be monochromatic. And somehow we said, if we can force a large number of rectangles to decompose this matrix, then we will have somehow uh, shown a lower bound on the deterministic complexity of the function. So let's just implement this plan for the equality function and maybe in a complicated way prove this. So what does uh, the, the communication matrix for the equality function look like? Well, let's order the x's here and the y's here. And these are all elements of <coughs> 0, 1 to the n. And let's use the same ordering. Yeah? So then the equality. You have ones only on the diagonals and zeros elsewhere. Okay. And now you can notice that each of these ones has to be part of some rectangle. Every input is part of some rectangle of the protocol. Why? Because look at this input, x and y, which takes you, sorry, and then feed this x and y to the protocol and see where it gets to. And that L will include this x and y. So every input is part of some rectangle. So each of these is also part of some rectangle. And uh, so the number of such, yeah. now the important thing is two of these ones cannot be part of the same rectangle. Because a rectangle is supposed to be monochromatic. So if it includes two ones, then it will also include the zero here, which it's not allowed to. So each of these ones has to be part of a different rectangle. So the number of rectangles has to be at least two to the n. And <coughs> so get a lower bound of n. Yeah? Because the number of leaves becomes two to the n. So the depth has to be at least n. rectangle that contains one yes. has to be one by one rectangle. One by one rectangle. And but what about the rectangles that contain zero? Can they be bigger? They can be bigger, yes. And you don't care about this. Oh, I see. So there are two to the n ones already. So sorry. Already. That gives me the n. Two n by two n. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I should say. Okay, sorry, 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 I missed Two to the n cross two to the n matrix.
question. So there are these two to the n rectangles, but there are some zero rectangles as well. Yes. So you get more than two to the n leaves. So how do you account for that? Yeah. There might be a plus or minus one in the, my formulation because the answer needs to get to both. Yeah, I, I should have paid attention. I did. So at the moment, it looks like my lower bound is more than my upper bound. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll fix that. Yeah, I'll come back. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, so now, there's Alice and Bob. Yeah. Uh, so they have the same inputs. We're still talking about the equality problem. And they're allowed to now toss coins. Okay. And what do we mean by that? Okay. So there are two models that we'll be discussing about uh, uh, randomized communication complexity. And one of them is private coins. I think the answer is that the way we set this up, the, uh, the referee needs to know the answer. Okay, so by that, looking at the transcript, we should be able to tell the answer. And if you set the definitions right according to that, you'll probably get n plus 1 for both. So there are two models of uh, randomized uh, communication complexity. And one is private coins, and the other is public coins. And I'll just tell you what it is. So you have Alice and Bob. So I'm talking about the private coins model. So they, in addition to their input, <coughs> they have a source of randomness. I'm sorry. And so Alice tosses some coins. And And I call that R of A. And similarly, Bob tosses some coins, and we call that R of B. Now, Alice's entire actions will now be determined not only by X, but also by her coin tosses. And similarly, Bob's actions will be determined by Y as well as R of B. So in terms of protocol tree, so in the private coins model, it's uh, easy to sort of model the effect of this using a protocol tree. So what was our old protocol tree? When it was Alice's turn, based on her input, she just decides to go left or right. And similarly, when it was Bob's turn, he went left or right based on the input y. Okay. Now, when we are at such a node, Alice can go left or right with certain probabilities. It doesn't have to be just 0 or 1. Okay? So she could say, my input is such that I would like to go left with probability 1 fourth and right with probability 3 fourths. Okay? So we just imagine that it's the same thing. It's the same protocol tree and everything. And, but at each node, what we have is a probability p and 1 minus p. And this p and 1 minus p can depend the value p can depend on the input x. What probability she, need, she wants to go left or right depends on her input x. And again, the fact that it can also depend on what Bob has said so far is all captured by the fact that you have reached this node. So now, for each input x, as soon as the input is available to Alice, Alice will be able to set up p and 1 minus p and on all the nodes with label A. And Bob similarly sets up his Q, 1 minus Q values.
for all the nodes that are labeled B. Okay. Then the computation starts, and now it's a walk down this tree, which is governed by these probabilities. Okay. And then you reach a particular leaf, and you announce the answer. Is that, uh, yeah. <coughs> Public coins model. Yeah. So. Don't sorry, what did I do? We don't have this <coughs> restriction. The common random string is available here. Both Alice and Bob can consult it at any time. Okay. And so then you come to a particular node, you decide to go left or right based on your input and also the common random string. So in other words, if we fix one value of the common random string, then this becomes a deterministic protocol. Yeah. Uh, it need not be correct in the sense that we allow, <coughs> and I will tell you what the role of epsilon is. Uh, in the correctness or the definition of correctness. Okay. So you get a tree for each random choice R. So actually, you can think of a public coins protocol as a probability distribution over deterministic protocols. Okay. <coughs> so yeah, we'll just see an example for equality, and then hopefully things will become clearer. Alice has n bits, Bob has n bits, and they need to determine if the uh, inputs are identical. Okay. Turns out that, uh, okay, so we'll talk about private coins protocols later, but let's talk about public coins first. Turns out that uh, there's a dramatic difference in the amount of communication needed to solve this problem if you allow a little bit of error. Okay, so so what do I mean by this? I'm not going to write down the entire definition, but let me just say it. We want to minimize the worst case communication. The worst case communication of a randomized protocol that uses public coins computes the function f with probability 1 minus epsilon. That means for every input, the probability of error should be at most epsilon. <clears throat> so once you fix a particular input, the protocol runs. It might give the correct answer or not, but the probability of error should be at most epsilon. Okay. This should be true for every uh, epsilon. And protocol which achieves this, among all such protocols, we take the one which has the minimum worst case communication, and that is defi defined to be the randomized public coin epsilon error complexity of f. Okay? When we are talking about private coins, we just replace this by private, and then we have this. This is just notation. 
Okay, so here Alice has x, Bob has y, and there is a random string r here. Now, so we are free to visualize what random string we want here, and then build the protocol according to that. So a natural uh, random string that we can put here is a In other words, this random string is a random hash function from n bits to 1 bit. Okay. So the way it is stated, it is actually a table of length 2 to the n. For each of the 2 to the n possible inputs, we have either a 0 or a 1. So the, they are using huge amounts of randomness. But at the moment, that's allowed in the model. What we are interested in is how much communication do we need? So what does Alice send Bob? <laughs> Alice views the common randomness as a hash function. She applies that hash function to her input x, sends it to Bob. Yeah. So Alice sends h of x, and Bob checks if h of x. So what does, what happens? If x is equal to y, then probability of error the two inputs are the same, there's the hash function is going to result in the same value, there'll be no error. But if x is not equal to y, then in this table of h, Alice and Bob will be consulting different locations, and the probability that these two values turn out to be the same is at most half. Yeah? Set it up, it's probably half. It's possible that even though the two inputs are different, Alice and Bob come to the conclusion that, uh, or at least claim that they are the same, but this happens with probability at most half. Now, if you wanted this probability to be made smaller, you could just replace this to 0, 1 to the k, yeah. and then this will go to. So this epsilon can be made smaller by just changing. So you can see with constant amount of communication, yeah. with constant amount of communication in the public coins model, we can bring down the error Any small constant. But what is it constant? Isn't it k? Oh, sorry. So if no, it depends on the error, right? So if you want any constant error, epsilon, based on that error, maybe log one over epsilon, is the communication. <coughs> So, uh, meaning each of these hash values here, are they independently chosen? Yeah. So, my, uh, so yeah, when I said that pick a random hash function, I meant among all hash functions, take the collection of all hash functions and pick one at random. So, if you do that, then each of these bits will be uniformly 0 or 1 and also independent of each other. So, at this point, one could ask, I mean, this looks really horrible. That is, uh, we seem to be cheating in the sense that we are using a large amount of randomness. Of course, that is not being generated after looking at the input. But could we make this smaller? Yeah. So if you just 
think about it, we just needed some sort of pairwise independence instead of total independence. So we could, instead of using this model of hash functions, we could just visualize this r to be an element of 0, 1 to the n. And what Alice sends is the dot product of x and z and Bob checks if Did you mean that is element zero one to the end? Sorry, this is R, yeah? What did I do? <laughs> okay, so this is still instead of two to the n bits of randomness. Now we are using n bits of randomness. And if we really think about it, so what we are doing is somehow computing the Hadamard code of x and y. So these are all possible n bit strings. And x is an n-bit string. We take its dot product mod 2, and we choose one of these. So is it clear what I mean by this matrix? This is all possible strings of n-bits. We choose one of these rows, take its dot product with x, and send it to Bob. And Bob takes the same row, computes the dot product with y, and checks whether they are equal or not. Okay. And what we know is that if x is different from y, then there will be the, the output. Yeah? x multiplied by this matrix will differ from y multiplied by this matrix on at least half the places. Okay. So again, we'll get that the probability of error is at most half when inputs are different, but in, when the inputs x and y are the same, then the output is definitely one. So once we start viewing this as some code, you immediately realize that it was not important for us to use the Hadamard code. Yeah, some kind of random linear compression. We could use any, yeah, we could use any error correcting code, so we could first Alice, here's what Alice does. She treats her n bit input x as the message and encodes it using some error correcting code, let's say with polynomial length. Okay. And Bob does the same thing. Then Alice can pick a particular i in the a particular bit of this error correcting code. Uh, of this code word and send it to Bob, and Bob can check whether that bit agrees with his bit or not. And with constant, if x and y are the same, then with probability 1, the value will be the same. But if x and y are different, with constant probability, they will detect that x is not equal to y. Now, if that constant is not good enough, we can repeat and drive the probability down. We care about minimum distance because we want the uh, different inputs x and y, their code words should differ on a good fraction of places. Sorry, let me write down the protocol. Yeah, yeah. I care about the distance because. <coughs>
takes a particular code, which takes n bits to, let's say, polynomially many in n bits, then what does Alice do? Alice in this range and sends and Bob checks if C of X I is the same as and when X and Y are different we want this test to fail with a decent probability, and for that we want c of x. So, so how does this c compare to that h hash of the Yeah, so it just selects a subcode, basically. Yeah. Oh. So that's why. This is like the long code. Or, <coughs> yeah. We are using a very long code. This, the intermediate thing I talked about was the Hadamard code. And now we say that it doesn't matter what code we use, as, as long as it has some distance. Yeah we will be able to detect the difference between x and y with constant probability. So what's the communication complexity in all this? Yeah, <laughs> seem to have lost track of that. Yeah, so how many bits does uh, Alice send? Okay, so she needs to send sorry, the i and the actual bit. Because that is what Bob will compare. So, and that is the reason we were careful about this being polynomially long, yeah? So, in a private, sorry, what was I saying? So, we, I'm still talking about public coins. So, in public coins, it, of course, doesn't matter. In private coins, now Bob can send, pick this, uh, sorry, Alice can pick this i at random in the range 1 to poly in n, that is log n bits, and then send this extra 1 bit, and that's all Bob needs to complete the task. Okay, so the total communication if we allowed public coins, then we could drive the error down to some small constant with constant amount of communication. But if we didn't have public coins, shared randomness, and we insisted that all the randomness be local to the two parties, we could still get efficient protocols, but it looks like we are doing it with log n bits of communication, not constant. Okay. Now, turns out that this is not something isolated to the equality function. So there's a theorem which says that you can always come uh, transform a public coins protocol to a private coins protocol with an overhead of log n. So let me just write that down. is this n. So if the inputs are n bits long, yeah, then if you have an efficient public coins protocol, then with an overhead of order log n, we also have an efficient private coins protocol. Okay, so this is true for all functions. Okay, we saw a particular instance of this 
for the equality function because the public coins complexity was only constant. The other question we need to ask is, is it true that we need login? If you allow yourself only private coins. And the answer is yes, and we'll talk about it next time. So lower bounds for uh, randomized communication complexity will be the topic of the next lecture tomorrow. And we will see this and many other such examples. So, yeah. so epsilon, let's think of it as something like one fourth, yeah, private of the equality function. Okay. So I think everything I've said today has been basic and maybe you could have easily anticipated it. Uh, I just want to show one sort of surprising protocol and then we'll stop. Why? They both are n bit strings. So Alice's input and Bob's input are both n bit strings. And let's say we have even been told that x is not equal to y. So they've been given inputs which differ. And what they have to find out And this is the position where perhaps one of them has a 0 and the other has a 1. To the left of this, they're all equal. Okay. And they need to communicate in order to find out the first position where they differ. Okay. And they're allowed to use randomness. They're allowed to use public randomness. And they need to find out this location. So we can use uh, typical computer science uh, tricks. Okay, so we sort of look at the left half and the right half. Okay, we ask, oh, is this position in the left half or is it in the right half? Now, how do we find out whether it's in the left half or right half? We just check whether this, whether they're equal or not equal. Okay, so uh, how do we do that? Well, we have seen three different ways of doing it, but anyway, we can do a randomized protocol to determine if there is a difference in the left half or not. If there is no difference in the left half, they work on the right half and they continue. So in log n steps, yeah, at, at each step, um, they find out whether to go left or right. And after log n steps, uh, they come down to the location, the leftmost location, okay, with high probability. Now, how small do we need to keep the error? Okay, there are log n equality protocols that are being run, okay? And if we do things naively, uh, each of them can have a certain probability of error, and these probabilities add up. Okay, so just to keep the probabilities down, we would like to choose, sorry, I've erased my k, but there used to be a one over two to the k here. If we allowed k bits of communication, then the error went down 
as 1 over 2 to the k. So we would like to keep the k as such that this number becomes something like 1 over log n, so k as log log n. So there is a log n times log log n bits protocol. Okay, I'll let you imagine how it works. Yeah. Based on equality. You repeatedly use equality, keep the error down at all stages, and log n rounds each with log log n bits of communication. So <coughs> interesting. So Peleg, Raghavan, and Upfal, they did something, I think, really clever and got rid of this log log n. And I just want to show you how that works. And so it's again using the same equality protocol as the basis, but uh, yeah. Imagine you have a tree set up on this. There are these n possible answers that you could give, and you just arrange them as a binary tree. And the, the protocol that I explained here, it seems to be walking down this tree to the right place where x and y differ, the leftmost place where they differ. And at each step, it spends log log n bits to go. The protocol they propose has the following property. At each round, we will only be doing constant amounts of communication. Okay. But we will be going the wrong way once in a while. Okay, so if our we decide to use only k bits of communication, then with probability 1 over 2 to the k, we might have gone the wrong way. But we will always keep in mind that we would have gone the wrong way, and we sometimes go back up the tree. Okay. So what this protocol will do is sort of go down, maybe come up, yeah, yeah, and uh, do so. and so on. And eventually, it will get to the right tree. So you both go down and up. Okay, so let me just quickly tell you what we need to do. If you're at this node yeah, in this tree, and you want to decide whether to go left, right, or up. Can you remind us what it means to be at that node? What, that, what it means to be at that node? OK, so you did the first round of coming. Computation. So this, you ran an equality protocol here, and you decided that the error is in the left left half. So that, that first node says left or left. left. Or okay. Half or half. Yes. Yeah. And then when you have come to this node, that means you have somehow isolated. You believe that this i lies in in this interval. So it, to be at this node means to believe that your i is in this interval. Sorry? At least you're testing that. Now I'm going to test that. Okay, so yeah. So we want to know where in this interval. Right. Now this interval consists of two sub intervals corresponding to the left tree and the right tree. And then there is stuff to the left here. Okay. So when you come to this tree, you just run an equality protocol on this part once again. <coughs> just to check. Maybe, you know, we came down here by mistake. Okay, and if it is here, then we back. Okay, 
if that equality protocol says, look, you know, it still looks somewhat equal, then you continue check this left part. And if you discover a difference there, then you go down. But once you go down here, it doesn't mean that you believe this. Again, check. Okay, so at every step, you check if there is some reason to backtrack. Okay? And you do all this with a large-ish K. I'm not going to tell you the details. So at any node, there is an obvious direction to go in order to get here. That is this direction. And these are all bad directions. If you use a big enough K, you can set it up so that you always move with probability three-fourths in the right direction. Question. But then the complexity of this is not characterized by the depth, depth of the, of the That's graph. Right. Yeah, so I will need to tell you how many times you will keep moving up and down. And just, yeah, I'll tell you that. Okay. But right now, the naive protocol is this. When you are at a particular node, decide whether you should go back up, go left, or go right. Okay. <laughs> and all this is done by running the basic equality protocol with a suitable okay. Now, the question was, does it ever get here? Yeah. And when does it get here? Okay, and does it get within log n steps? Yeah, okay. So here's what I suggest. You, there is a correct leaf, right? You hold that leaf and kind of hang the tree from that leaf. Yeah. So hold this leaf and hang the tree. The branches are all heavy. They kind of go down and just pat it up. Yeah, all right. So it becomes a line, right? So this special node i, the leaf i, is here. And then there are there is a tree which hangs out, and, and so there are many nodes which there might be leaves which terminate are here. But just pad them up. Yeah. Now, if you see, look at this process. Is it not a random walk on this line with a drift three fourths always in the direction of i, and one fourth? No matter where you are, the probability of getting closer to i is always at least three fourths. Yeah. And the total length is log n. Now I'll let you convince yourself that if you have such a random walk, the probability that after log n steps you have still not hit the sin of the constant ten times log n steps is very small. This is the protocol. Sorry, I went over time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll see you again tomorrow.